Okay, okay. Thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and DBN in particular. So let me start mentioning the other people, sorry, the other people behind this work. So we have Harold Baranger, who was here the first two weeks, from uh, and uh, Liu Fang. Uh, they are both from Duke University in the U.S., where I've just finished spending six months as a long-term visitor. Uh, uh, this study is not intended to be a ghost author, so we are just three people. Uh, what else? So in, sh uh, uh, in short, uh, uh, in this talk, I'm gonna, we're gonna, in this work, we study the open dynamics of a qubit undergoing single photon scattering in a waveguide. So the essential questions that we wanted to answer uh, are, how does such open dynamics look like in general? What are its uh, uh, peculiar features? Then uh, what, is, what, was, what was actually the original question of ours? So how non-Markovian is this dynamics? And where does non-Markovian behavior stem from? So what are the sources, the typical sources of non-Markovian in this system? So this talk uh, is split in, uh, basically in three main parts. Part one, I'll be, uh, I'll be discussing why it is important to answer these questions. In part two, which is mostly review, I will uh, talk about general, general theoretical tools that we use to answer these questions, and these are mostly related uh, to uh, normal community measures. And then finally, in part three, uh, I will uh, illustrate what we did, actually, the outcomes that we got and the interpretations of them. You may, you may find weird that part two, which is mostly review, is this long. So the, uh, the point is that I thought it was uh, worthwhile talking about uh, notions and ideas related to with non marcoianity measures, which in, uh, and spread them in the communities attending this conference, also because of the title of this conference. This is mostly because this is a topic which is, uh, which is currently receiving a large attention in the literature, as witnessed by two review articles that appeared uh, on uh, Review of Modern Physics over the last year or so. So to begin with WaveGuy QED, I guess you heard uh, about uh, uh, WaveGuy QED in a number of talks throughout the three weeks of this conference. So WaveGuy QED is a, a novel paradigm of modern quantum optics, uh, studying the Korean coupling of one or more qubits to a one-dimensional waveguide, sustaining a one-dimensional elect electromagnetic field. Um, uh, in most cases, it can be a uh, model uh, as having a linear dispersion law, but not necessarily. So, uh, similarly to the strong coupling regime of wake IQED, a basic condition is that the decay rate of the qubit into the uh, waveguide be much larger than uh, the rate into the non protected the modes that are non protected by the waveguide. And it turns out that this condition is, is now uh, well matched in a number of experimental setups, such as circuit QED, photonic crystals, and many others. So whenever you deal with uh, uh, typical wave QED setups featuring more than one qubit, the so natural characteristic length is, of course, the, qubit qub the inter-qubit distance, D. Now, this distance, you see that it introduces a, a characteristic time, which is the delay time. Uh, namely the time taken by the photon to travel be, uh, between the qubits. And uh, so the point is that uh, the, 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 uh, you, can, you can wonder how long is this, is this delay time? Um, uh, how should, uh, what, uh, what criterion one should use to establish how long it is? The criterion is that uh, the meter is in fact the decay rate of the qubit into the waveguide. So in such a way that this gamma tau, gamma is the decay rate, uh, sorry, the meter is the decay time of the qubit into the waveguide, and this gamma is the decay rate. So in such a way that this, the product between this decay rate and uh, the delay time is much, if this product is much lower, uh, smaller than one, then you are in the regime of neg negligible time delays. Uh, otherwise, uh, you are in the, uh, these del time delays are important, are significant. So it turns out that Waveguide QED so far has been mostly uh, 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 has mostly dealt with the regime of negligible time delays, and uh, so it is actually the standard regime in Waveguide QED. One reason being that 
uh, in most of current experimental setups, uh, length are sufficiently short and or velo group velocity, velocities is su sufficiently large that this delay time uh, is not so important. However, latex experiments are entering the regime, seems to be entering the regime of non-negligible time delays. And uh, there is actually a very solid, there are actually solid mo uh, mo uh, motivations, solid reasons to expect that this trend will continue in the next future. The reason being that uh, be, uh, basically the wish to implement long distance quantum information processing tasks. Now, the regime of non negligible time delays is uh, essentially a, a largely unexplored land. And one reason being that it's generally theoretically very tough to describe this regime. Uh, Three uh, instances of uh, major effects that are due to the presence of long time delays. One is that uh, entanglement, gener the entanglement generation by spontaneous emission is spoiled by delay times. Another one is that photon photon correlations in scattering processes uh, are qualitatively affected by the presence of long time delays. And uh, what is probably most re more, uh, more related to what I'm going to talk about, the master equation, the spontaneous emission process uh, of many qubits is no more ruled by a Lindblad master equation. Why it is not? Because uh, whenever you have significant delay times, you expect that you introduce, this introduces memory effects in the system, and so you expect that no Markovian effects arise. So here, uh, our goal was to uh, explore uh, and assess and even quantify, as you will see, how large are these non-Markovian effects in a, in a case study. And the case study is just the scattering, a single photon scattering process uh, from a qubit in a waveguide, both in the infinite and semi-infinite uh, infinite case. Of course, in the semi-infinite case, uh, 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 semi-infinite case can be regarded as the infinite waveguide case uh, in the presence of a, of a mirror. <coughs> the intuitive expectation would be that in the infinite waveguide case, the dynamics is, is uh, fully Markovian, and that in, semi -infinite, uh, in the semi-infinite waveguide case, uh, it is not. This is because in the latter case, uh, the mirror introduces a uh, delay time due to the uh, time required by the photon to go back and forth between the qubits uh, and, uh, and this end of the waveguide. And this delay time is expected to introduce the Markovianity. So we will see that this expectation is to some extent at least inaccurate. Okay, and here comes the question. What does the Markovian mean in quantum mechanics? Um, <clears throat> uh, before uh, tackling this question, a uh, 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 necessary premise. I guess uh, most people, most if not all people here are familiar with the Lindblad master equation. Actually, the full name uh, is uh, Gorini Kosakowski Sudarshan Limbla master equation. You should be careful when you write down papers to use this <laughs> general uh, name. Uh, just as a curiosity, this equation was introduced back in 1976 in independent papers, and its 40th anniversary was celebrated last year uh, in a symposium held in Poland. So the Limbla master equation uh, is uh, time local, as you know, and it features a uh, uh, Hamiltonian part describing the unitary part of the dynamics, and then uh, and, and there is a non-unitary part featuring these uh, jump operators and associated rates. Let me stress that these rates uh, must be positive. What is probably the most well-known uh, instance of Limbla master equation is a uh, familiar spontaneous emission of a two-level uh, atoms in uh, free space, uh, where you see that only a rate appears here and only one jump operator. So once again, what does non Markovian mean in quantum mechanics? So I guess that if you ask a guy in, uh, across communities dealing with master equation at random, probably the most popular answers would be non Markovian means uh, dynamics that cannot be described by a Lindblad master equation, one possibility. Another possibility is that is uh, uh, dynamics uh, which is described by a time no local master equation. Now, it turns out that uh, in 2009, some people uh, asked the question whether it is possible 
to give a definition of non-Markovian, or Markovian if you wish, that is detached from the structure of any master equation. This is, a, in general, a difficult task. Uh, so what could we do? One could be, we could be tempted to naturally extend, as happens in many cases, the classical definition of Markovian and non-Markovian, which is well established. Markovian and non-Markovian, of course, actually in classical stochastic processes. Uh, I guess most of you will be familiar with this expression here. But what is the problem? The problem is that this is formulated in terms of a single observable, or in general, a, a few observables. Whereas in the quantum realm, even the simplest system, a, a two-level system, yeah, qubit, in fact, spin for half particle, will have a, uh, an infinite number of uh, independent observables. And what is worst is the uh, uh, wave function collapse principle. So measurements, this is formulated in terms of measurements, but measurements will collapse, will in general perturb the step of the system. So this is a very, very tough way. Uh, it's very complicated to follow these, these rules. So the way out with it is now well established is to uh, formulate the problem in terms of the so-called dynamical map. So uh, in order to introduce the dynamical map, let me first briefly review the, uh, uh, what quantum maps are, because dynamical map is a special quantum map. So a uh, quantum map is a super operator, basically. So you know a super operator associates uh, an operator to another operator. An instance is, is just a Limbladian term of the right-hand side of the Limbla master equation associating uh, the, dens uh, the density operator of the system at time t to this guy here. So this way we could, uh, we could uh, uh, yeah, as we saw many times during this conference, so we can write down the Limbler master equation in this compact form. You can deal with super operators, uh, uh, just, um, uh, you can manipulate them uh, uh, in many respects, just like uh, with ordinary operators with a similar algebra in such a way that this solution can be written this way in terms of the exponential of the Limbladian superoperator times time. What is a quantum map? A quantum map is, so to speak, a superoperator that tries to map an uh, initial physical state into another physical state. In order to be so, the output of this map when acting on a density operator is required to be Hermitian, as you know, positive, and its trace should be one. It turns out that actually, in general, the positivity uh, may not be sufficient, and in general, you, are, you uh, need to uh, uh, invoke a, mod a stronger property that is called complete positivity, where complete positivity implies positivity, but I will not talk uh, more about this. It just, it just suffices to say that uh, physical operations are described by quantum maps that should be completely positive. Now, what is the dynamical map? The dynamical map is basically the counterpart of the time evolution operator for closed systems in the case of open quantum systems. So it's, such, it's uh, that super operator, that quantum map that when applied to an arbitrary, let me stress arbitrary initial state of the system, turns it into the, its evolved state at times t, like this. Now, if the system is coupled to uh, an environment R and they start in a product state uh, such that and the joint evolution is unitary, it can be shown that this, the, the dynamical map is a quantum map that is always assured to be completely, completely positive as one would require. Let me stress that the dynamical map, this important object, depends on what, what does it depend on? It depends on the, uh, the total system bath Hamiltonian through the, the uh, time evolution operator, and importantly, the initial state of the reservoir, okay? So we introduced, uh, I talked first about the Limbla master, dynamics described by the Limbla master equation. Limbla master equation is actually the prototypical uh, uh, Markovian dynamics. Uh, when does Limbla master equation uh, uh, take place? What dynamics are described by Limbla master equation? Consider the class of dynamical maps fulfilling the so-called semi-group property. So that means that the dynamical map at time t can be decomposed, or to better say, divide as uh, the, 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 the dynamical map at, at, an, at any intermediate time t1 times followed by the uh, dynamical map at time t minus t1. 
where well, let me stress again that TNT1 are totally arbitrary. So it can be shown that uh, <coughs> dynamics uh, uh, fulfilling this semi-group property are dis exactly described by the Limbaugh mass equation. In some sense, to some extent, this is reasonable, because you see that uh, in order for a, a dynamical map to fulfill this semi-group property, this must be uh, of the exponential form, right? And so, once it is, uh, since it is in the exponential form, it obeys a master equation, a time-independent master equation of, uh, of this form. And now the task is just to show that uh, the Limbladian has the usual uh, structure in terms of the jump operators. And uh, you, can you can carry out this task uh, by imposing complete positivity, which is uh, this was actually the essence of the Limblad theorem. Let me stress once again that rates are positive. Okay. Now, people realize that uh, more recently, that th this is not actually the most general way to divide the dynamical map when it is possible to divide in some way. So let me consider, let us ask, let me consider given the dynamical map, the inverse dynamical map t minus one. Of course, d may not. This, in general, we almost almost uh, never it will be a physical map, but almost always it will be mathematical defined as a matter of fact. And now, what you can do is uh, considering is your dynamical map this way, and you multiply by this guy which is the identity. Now, we have rearranged this like this, pt minus 1, pt1. And you baptize this guy here as the two-time map, pttt1, right? Now, wh while this pt1 is, of course, uh, CP, this guy is not CP in general, completely positive. Uh, except in the case that, uh, phi, that t1 is zero. In this case, phi t0, of course, reduces to your dynamical map, since this guy is, of course, uh, since this guy is, of course, one, this guy here. So this way, you can decompose uh, your dynamical map this way here. Now, I define uh, 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 the dynamics to become CP divisible whenever this two time map is completely positive, whatever time T1, T and T1. Okay? Now, you may see that, of course, if the dynamical map is, of the Limbla, is a Limbladian one, or being the Limbla master equation, this trivially fulfills this, the, this is trivially uh, CP divisible. Now, the key point is that the class of dynamical maps fulfilling this CP divisibility condition is strictly larger than those described by Limbla master equation. Okay? So this set is far larger. <coughs> so this motivates to uh, define Markovianity in a more modern uh, sense as, for instance, the property of, being, of uh, dynamics of being uh, CP divisible. Let me, may, let me anticipate that this is not the only way of defining what quantum Markovian means, uh, even though, in my own opinion, this is the most fundamental one. Um, okay, so if uh, Limbladen dynamics, the dynamical map, are not the only one fulfilling the CP divisibility condition, what is the form, what is the master equation ruling? the uh, most general CP divisible dynamical maps, it can be shown that this is again a, a, a mass equation formally uh, analogous to the Limbland mass equation, but where, however, the Hamiltonian rates and jump operators are in general time dependent. Importantly, if CP divisibility is ensured, all these rates here, although time dependent, are sure to be always positive. What is even more is that in, a, in a rather general conditions, even uh, maps that are dynamical maps that are non CP divisible can be written in this form, once again through the, this time dependent, uh, described by this time dependent master equation. 
But importantly, in, that, in those cases, rates are not ensured to be uh, positive at all times. So uh, you can use the fact that at least one of the rates appearing in the master equation, this, this time independent master equation, may take neg negative values even at a single instant of time as a criterion to uh, assess whether or not uh, dynamics is Markovian or Markovian according to the CP divisibility criterion. And uh, the so-called uh, well-known uh, uh, reverse well gap linear measure is a normal community measure is based on this criterion. Okay, what about instances of um, uh, yes? It's, you can interpret this as a momentaneous recoherence of the of the open system. Recoherence. So the open system deco normally decoherent to, into the reservoir. But the reservoir can give back information to the system. It's, this is a momentous recoherence of the system. So I'll tell you. Uh, <clears throat> this actually, since T T one here are arbitrary, you can you can you can you can see that this is equivalent to saying that the dynamics can be decomposed into infinitesimal maps that are completely positive, right? Now, it turns out that the dynamics that are completely positive is described by a Limblad master equation with positive rates, right? So, if, if rates are not always positive at all times, it means that there is at least uh, a DT where the dynamics uh, is locally non-CPT, non-CP. No, I guess you can call it rates, I mean, mathematically, but of course, physically, yeah, it can be, it can be questionable. Uh, 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 regarding uh, physical interpretation, I'll be talking about this uh, in, uh, later in this talk. If you're not satisfied, ask me at the end, okay? <laughs> so these are, there are uh, very, very, uh, very many instances of dynamics uh, where uh, CP divisibility can occur uh, without uh, fulfilling at the same time Limbla master equation. So the instance I'm more interested uh, in now is that is the Spontaneous emission of an atom, which is coupled to a bosonic bath, uh, initially in the vacuum state, uh, under the re rotating wave approximation. So you know that the ground uh, state will remain uh, unchanged, whereas uh, the uh, while the excited state uh, times the vacuum will go into a superposition of excited state times vacuum and a, a single photon uh, state of the reservoir times the ground state. We are called this epsilon t, the excited state ampli uh, amplitude, probability amplitude for the atom. Okay. <laughs> now it's easy to show that when you trace uh, over the, when you consider an arbitrary initial state for your open system, and you you consider the joint unitary dynamics, and then you trace over the field, then the dynamical map looks this way. So this is the evolved state at time t, and these are the entries, of course, of the initial uh, density operator. Now, it, it can be proven that uh, the, in this case, the time-dependent master equation takes this form, where you see you have a, we have a single jump operator and associated rate gamma t. This gamma t takes this, uh, is given by this, this expression here. It can be shown easily that uh, if a time, there is a time at which this gamma t is negative, then this is equivalent to saying that the uh, atomic population at the same time, is growing in time, okay? Can you say when the atomic population in the spontaneous emission process can pro grow in time at some point? Vacuum Rabi oscillation, for instance, the most typical instance. <coughs> so the excited state amplitude of is in general this integral differential equation, which depends on the spectral density of the bath. In the case of, let me consider two instances. In the case of a lossy cavity, then the spectral density is a Lorentzian one, uh, which depends on the atom cavity coupling rate and the cavity plan width this way. And this is the solution which can be obtained analytically. When the atom cavity coupling rate is below half the uh, cavity bound width, then uh, you can just have monotonic non-exponential decay. And based on what I said before, this means that the rates are ensured to be positive at all times, okay? So the decay is non-exponential, so the, uh, the dynamics does not obey Limblad, but it's uh, still CP divisible. 
In the other case, instead, the dumped oscillations in general take place, and the dynamics is not Markovian according to the CPD visibility uh, definition. Another instance is an atom emitting undergoing spontaneous emission in a semi infinite waveguide, which is very related to what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, in this case, the spectral density is sinusoidal, and the integral differential master equa uh, uh, equa uh, equation for the excitation. Amp you mean this? Oh yes, you need you need a GK going like sine k x naught, where x naught is the position of the of the atom. Uh, the integral differential equation ruling out ruling the excitation uh, amplitude of the of the atom as, uh, takes the form of a delay differential equation, and there are two important parameters here. One is the uh, basically the ratio between the delay time. Uh, uh, due to the mirror and the qubits, and, uh, and the decay rate of the qubits. And the phase difference acquired uh, in a round trip by the photon in a round trip between the qubit and mirror. And you can see that the uh, parameter space is divided into two regions by a finite threshold, where in this region uh, rates are sure to be positive, whereas in this region they can take negative values. Okay, now we go to, to our problem. So our idea was to uh, uh, apply these uh, concepts uh, to uh, assess how non-Markovian is the open dynamics of a qubit undergoing single photon scattering in a, in a one-dimensional waveguide. So it is important that this is a scattering process. I want to stress this because rarely in the, open, in the literature concerned with non-Markovianity measures, uh, processes uh, of this kind are considered, if, or even never. Uh, so, because in most cases, there, uh, so in this case, the buff is of course embodied by the one dimensional uh, waveguide field. Mm -hmm. um, so, in emission processes or simulated emission processes, uh, the initial state of the buff uh, is the vacuum state or the thermal state. Here, the point is that the initial state of the buff is a single photon uh, wave packet. So, it's basically the incoming wave packet that, is, uh, that you are sending from, say, the left side to the qubit. Okay, the Hamiltonian is a rather standard one. Uh, this is just a, a routine way to arrange it to study scattering processes in terms of uh, right going and left going uh, annihilation and creation operators of the, of the waveguide field. Uh, okay, so our goal is to calculate the dynamical map. As, a, as I stressed uh, more than once, uh, the key point is calculating the dynamical map. Of course, the, once you have the dynamical map, you know the open dynamics of your uh, open system, which is the qubit in this case, fully. Now, similar to the spontaneous emission case, uh, mm -hmm. to calculate the dynamical map, it is enough to consider these two elementary processes. One is the process where the photon, the, sing the incoming single photon scatters from the atom initially in the ground state, from the atom or qubit, if you want, initially in the ground state. Another one is the process, the scattering process where the photon scatters from the qubit is initially in the excited state, okay? Uh, now, using uh, conservation of uh, total number of excitations, uh, you see that uh, you can uh, write down these ansatz here, where this phi1 is a single photon uh, uh, unnormalized uh, state. This is an excited state amplitude. Uh, this is a two photon uh, 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 unnormalized field state, and this is a single photon unnormalized field state. Now, the first scattering process takes place in the one excitation sector, the second one in the two excitation sector, and of course, this is the tougher one to deal with, to cope with. Now, similarly to the following a reasoning, similar to the one uh, uh, that I described in the spontaneous emission case, uh, whenever you have an, an arbitrary initial state for, the, for, your, for your qubit, it turns out that the state at time t uh, describing the dynamical map takes this form here. Okay, so this is the dynamical map. This is what we call the scattering dynamical map. The scattering dynamical map depends on three uh, time functions. We have this PG, PE, and C. Note that despite the name, this PG and PE are both excited states prob uh, probabilities for the, for the, for the qubit. 
In the process where the qubit initially, initially starts in G, as recalled by the sub, sub, subscript here, so this process here, and the, the excited state probability of the qubit in the process where it starts in the excited state, as in this case here. This C is instead the scalar product between these two unnormalized single photon uh, states. And an important quantity is the, is the difference between these two excited state probability, which I call delta. You'll see that it plays an important role. So this, is a, this, this may look a bit abstract, right? So the best way to understand what happens is to resort to the block sphere representation. In the block sphere representation, as you picture, as you know, uh, a state uh, is represented by a three-dimensional block vector whose x and y components are related to the coherences, whereas the z component is related to the populations, right? Or inversion. And it turns out that the dynamical map in this representation takes this form. So the, the block vector at time t is first uh, displaced. This displacement is described by this vector here. Okay? This displacement doesn't play a very important role. I will not, uh, not talk much about this. What is most important is that after this displacement, an affine transformation is applied to the initial vector, to the initial block vector. This transformation is, is described by a three, a three times three uh, matrix, where you see that where this is a two times two rotation, a standard two times two rotation matrix. Okay, so what happens? The, apart from the displacement, the block vector is first rotated is rotated around, uh, around the z axis. Okay. And at the same time, its uh, x, y, and z components are contracted by factors, square modulus of c and delta, and modulus of delta respectively. Okay? So the contraction on the x, for the x, y, uh, and z components are different. This means that in general, the initial box sphere is turned into an ellipsoid. Now, this is a very peculiar feature. Because it, does, it cannot occur with spontaneous emission. In the case of spontane the spontaneous emission dynamical map, which I introduced previously, uh, uh, when written down in this block sphere representation, this transformation matrix takes this form, where this is again the excitation uh, probability amplitude of the qubit. So you see that in this case, both the uh, x, y, and z components are contracted by the same factors. That means that in this case, the block sphere is always turned into a another sphere at time t. <coughs> another peculiar, very peculiar feature that can occur with spontaneous emission is that you see that this guy here is, is ensured to be positive, whereas this delta t being the difference between, uh, you may, uh, between, these two, uh, between, between these two populations is not ensured to be positive at all times. You'll see the consequence, uh, consequences of this shortly. What about the time-dependent mass equation? It took some work, but at the end we managed to prove that the dynamical map is described at any time by this time-dependent mass equation. This is kind of interesting. So we have here, of course, we have all the time-dependent things. We have, we see that the uni non-unitary part deals of three, non uh, three Lindbladians. So we have a, a Lindbladian for describing the emission of a photon, a Lindbladian describing the absorption of a photon, and what, is, what was surprising in the beginning is the Lindbladian describing pure dephasing. Hmm? Where does this pure dephasing arise? This pure dephasing is related to the asymmetry I was talking before. So the asymmetry of the, of the transformation, so the fact that the block sphere is not turned into another sphere but into an ellipsoid, causes this pure dephasing. These are descriptions for the time-dependent rates in terms of the three quantities, the uh, time-dependent quantities I was talking about before. Okay, this was actually, uh, I think you should make it, okay. What about explicit computation? This, this was general. What about explicit computation of the dynamical map? This was actually the part that took longer, and it was mostly the work by Leo Fang. It took very, uh, several months. The reason is that in order to, the dynamical map and normal community measures are formulated in terms of the, uh, rep, uh, of the representation of your dynamic in the, in the time domain. So you are necessarily forced to study the time evolution of scattering. Okay, so we had to study the time evolution 
of the two elementary scattering processes. I mean, the one where the qubit is initially in the ground state and the one where the qubit is initially in the, in the excited states, which, which are respectively one and two excitation uh, uh, processes. And we had to do this both in the infinite waveguide case and in the, in the, in the hard uh, semi-infinite waveguide case. Unfortunately, I don't have time to give you details. So, the, uh, but just uh, mentioned the general approach. The general approach is that we write down equations and uh, 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 we work out differential equations involving uh, these three amplitudes here, which are those entering the dynamical map definition. And then we try to, we attempt to solve this uh, uh, differential equation uh, uh, as best as possible. But we could, we could uh, manage to solve them analytically in the, both in the one and two excitation sector in the case of the infinite waveguide, and in the one excitation sector in the case of the uh, semi-infinite waveguide. In the two excitation sector semi-infinite waveguide, which is the toughest case, we could just work out to a nice uh, differential equation for this guy here, uh, which I don't have time to discuss about, and we solved, the, and we solved it numerically. And we finally, once we have these amplitudes, we finally uh, work, uh, calcul compute the, the three uh, time functions uh, entering the dynamical map. Okay, last three slides. Time enough, hope. So starting from the exp general expression of the uh, time-dependent rates that I introduced uh, a couple of slides ago, you can easily see that the sum of the gamma plus and gamma minus rates fulfills this uh, relationship here. Now, this immediately gives you a sufficient condition for a uh, uh, lack of CP, CP divisibility to take place. Why? So, delta is assured to be, uh, in the beginning, is assured to, is, a, is actually one, by definition. So, delta starts positive. Then, uh, if it happens to take uh, negative values at some instant of time, then it means that there must be an instant of time where delta becomes negative along with its derivative. If this is the place, then uh, the sum of these two rates is negative. So uh, one of these two rates must necessarily be negative. Okay? And so that means that rates in the, the time-dependent mass equation is not ensured to be positive all the time. So the negativity, so the, the possibility for this quantity to take negative values is a sufficient condition for a violation of CP divisibility to take place. In the case of the infinite waveguide, we could work out this quantity here uh, analytically. And what is this alpha here? This alpha is basically the uh, um, width of the uh, wave, uh, incoming wave packet in the, in the frequency space in units of the decay of the uh, qubit decay rates. So it turns out that uh, 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 this, uh, this, uh, this guy here can take negative values in a, in, a, in a window of, in, a, in an optimal range of uh, uh, wave packet width, which is uh, uh, approximately uh, of the order of the decay rate of the qubit. So that means that no Markovian behavior can take place even in the infinite waveguide case uh, for if the uh, wave packet width is, in an opti is finite and in an optimal range of values of the order of the qubit decay rates. That means that quasi-plane waves and the very localized wave packets are excluded. So if you send a plane wave, quasi-plane wave, then the process is going to be Markovian as you would expect in an infinite waveguide. But it will not be so if the wave packet has the, has the right width. Last two slides. So uh, I, I didn't talk about this so far, but... Uh, one point about non markovianity measures is the idea that given the dynamical map at all times, then you can associate this with a single number, a positive number, which if it's zero, that means that the dynam dynamics is Markovian. If it is positive, then the dynamics is non Markovian. There are pos uh, pos many possible ways to define this in the literature. What is the most suitable uh, in this case is the so-called uh, geometric measure of non markovianity so this is uh, very easy to uh, introduce. So recall once again that this is the transformation matrix uh, associated with the dynamical map. And this three times three matrix uh, as a determinant. And so the modulus of this determinant will be the ratio, the ratio 
uh, we, we, we will essentially be the volume of the ellips ellipsoid rescaled to the initial uh, uh, block sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and this can be interpreted as the volume of accessible states. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you can use the fact that this guy here can grow in time at some time as a witness of non-Markovian behavior. Why? The point, consider the limb blood mass equation, a dynamics of being the limb blood mass equation. Okay? Uh, and consider, for instance, the uh, familiar spontaneous uh, emission of an atom in free space. Then you know that whatever the initial state of the atom, this state will be asymptotically in time uh, be turned into the ground state. Okay? So what happens to the block sphere is that it is gradually contracted until it becomes a single point, and this point corresponds to the ground state. Okay? So for Limbladian, this qualitative explains why for Limbladian dynamics, this volume can only de monotonically decrease with time. And so you can use this as a criterion to uh, define uh, a dynamics that is no Markovian. So when this is not the place, so this guy can grow in time, then you define the normal community measure this way. <coughs> so you basically integrate over all time domains where this guy can grow, and this gives you your, your normal community measure that is defined by positive. What is, you may wonder what is the relationship with the previous criteria based on the neg negativity of rates. So it turns out that the uh, positivity of this derivative here is an sufficient conditions for, uh, in order for at least one of the rates to become negative. Okay? So that means that if a, a dynamics is no Markovian according to this geometric measure, it will be so according to the, uh, to the criterion based on the negativity of rates. Okay, this is the last slide, so I don't know why it is blur, blurry. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, so we calculated this uh, geometric no Markovian measure in the case of both infinite and semi-infinite waveguides. So in the infinite waveguide case, it's this black solid line here. I hope you can see this decently well. Okay. Uh, the outcome confirms what we saw in terms of the, of the, of the, of the behavior of the delta coefficient I talked about before. So non-Markovianity is non-zero only in an optimal range of wave packet width, which is uh, uh, approximately of the order of the decay rate. And it's zero for plane waves and very localized wave, wave packets. Uh, all the other curves refer to the semi-infinite waveguide case, so the present, in the presence of a mirror. Uh, <clears throat> uh, three observations. So first observation, you see that the, 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 the behavior is, uh, is, uh, is in general quite complex. So first of all, uh, the amount of non-Markovianity, this is what I meant uh, in the beginning, this is what I meant in the beginning when I said that we, with these tools, you are able to even say how much, how non-Markovian quantitatively is a, is a dynamics. You see that in the case of, uh, in the semi-infinite waveguide case, uh, the non-Markovian is, is typically larger. In some cases, even uh, an, over, an order of magnitude larger than in the infinite waveguide case. Second observation, you see that in this case, even when uh, alpha, Exactly. I'll come back to this point in a second. Second observation. Uh, now, even in the case of negligible alpha, meaning quasi-plane wave, then no Markovianity can be non-zero. And it turns out that it matches exactly the value that it has in the case of spontaneous emission of an atom in front of a mirror, which I talked about before. You, you, will, you might remember that I talked about the spontaneous emission of an atom in front of a mirror. And, it, it is, and this can be no Markovian. Third observation, you see that uh, the shape very much depends on, on the value of this k naught a, where this k naught a is the phase shift acquired by a photon to travel between the qubit and mirror. <coughs> so, um, a, a natural interpretation of these results is the following. You see that, uh, I mean, this is not an exact statement, but almost uh, exact. In most typical cases, uh, um, the, uh, the semi-infinite waveguide uh, curves lie above the infinite waveguide ones, okay? So the interpretation of this is the following. You have an intrinsic uh, source of non-Markovianity that is uh, related to the 
uh, way packet finite, finiteness. And this form of normal community can take place even in the infinite waveguide. When you add the mirror, so semi-infinite waveguide, the feedback due to the mirror and the delay time uh, associated with the auto qubit mirror distance introduces an additional uh, uh, mechanism for normal community, which, which was actually the one that we expected in the beginning. Okay? And the two uh, combine in such a way that the overall normal community is enhanced compared to the infinite waveguide case where you have no mirror. Okay, conclusions. So we work out in this work the dynamical map of a qubit undergoing single photon scattering in a waveguide. Uh, to this aim, uh, we had to work out the scattering time evolution, since this is required uh, in order to apply tools of open quantum system theory uh, related to normal community measure. The qubit open dynamics, I mean, regardless of any considerations about normal community, exhibits features that, does not, that cannot occur uh, with spontaneous emission. So the scattering dynamical map is qualitatively different from the spontaneous emission map. Uh, when the wave packet width uh, is, 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 uh, is significant. Uh, we applied recently developed measures and criteria of quantum macroreality, and once again, as I, as I, just, as I just finished saying, uh, two we uh, identified two fundamental sources of non-Markovian behavior. One is related to the wave packet uh, finiteness, and another one is related to the uh, feedback due to the mirror and hence the associated delay time. And uh, with this, and this final picture, uh, I thank you for your attention. Jason, so... Uh, the one due to Garway. Yeah, yeah. So how do you compare uh, that method compared to the way you are solving? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that is just another language. You mean... Uh, but they can capture all of this, what you are talking now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry? No. <laughs> Autom no, this is... No, this... I guess that is... That is, that is a technique. Yeah, are you familiar with this or not? Yeah. But probably, probably you mean something else. <laughs> Pseudo... Add extra modes. Yeah. So, so what is the question? No, okay. I'm saying, uh, uh, is there any speciality in your form, the way of formulation, this one compared to the like old one, the pseudo mode method? No, I mean the pseudo mode method is the, the way I understood it is, mm -hmm. is a technique to basically to solve uh, the spontaneous emission problems such as those uh, I talked about at some point in the talk. Okay, and so if you want a, a way to calculate the dynamical map for those class of problems, that's it. Then uh, I talked about general uh, properties of dynamical maps, quantum uh, community measure, and then I talked about the scattering time pr uh, process where you follow different techniques. My best answer. <laughs> Can I ask what, what you didn't mention uh, at all? The concept of entanglement between the the qubit and uh, the modes. What, what's the connection with the positivity or the, the completely positiveness oh, yes. versus that? So I guess you heard about this. Some, if, if you're asking this question, yeah, actually this also replies to his question. How? So you can prove that uh, when uh, when, the, when those rates when one, those rates are not assured to be positive, hmm, so that there exist uh, times at which they become negative. Then uh, consider, and this is actually at the core of the uh, reverse Welga play, uh, plane or normal community measure. So consider your open system, and uh, uh, consider another ancillary system, an auxiliary system, and consider the two initially in a maximally entangled state. Okay. If the rates are not assured, are assured to be positive all the times, then this entanglement can decrease in time. If the rates can happen to be negative at some point, then it means that this entanglement can grow in time at some point. What do you mean? The two systems are entangled. So I can't call it a rate. I mean, 
you know um, you have entanglement man. you can you have entanglement uh, yeah it's like a correlation you know there is no um it's not incoherent process right uh, what you're talking about is that the system can go to that uh, bath and come back this is what you mentioned right that's more like coherent process to me um, no, it's an incoherent process. When I talk about recoherence, it was just an, in, uh, uh, an attempt to interpret the negative rates, since you called for this interpretation. Of course, it's an incoherent process. Okay, maybe. Oh, yeah, okay. I, okay. Did I reply your question? Too? I think so. I, I see that there's a, there's a connection. So uh, this might be a case of a discussion that we need to okay. continue.